All right. So it was um, the, the, the case that I selected these images before yesterday's news, that the uh, Republicans in the Senate, uh, the majority of them had used the first filibuster of the year to block an inquiry into the January 6th assault on the Capitol. And of course, the images on the right are images from that uh, assault. The image on the left is the Reichstag fire in, in Germany in the early 1930s. And, and I'm, I, I do mean to suggest analogies. I don't mean to suggest that the two uh, events are equivalent. Obviously, Congress continues to function. A different leader was elected. Ultimately, the outcome of the 2020 presidential election was certified, and there was a relatively peaceful change of power. So, so, so things are different, but I do mean to suggest that there are important parallels and, 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 and that there is a, as uh, we will examine together today and in subsequent lectures, uh, a growing impatience with democracy in the United States, an increased demand for authority, and that at least in pockets of the population, that demand is being expressed as a wish for a more violent approach, either to or from the government or both, and that we saw this come into um, uh, the, the, the clear spotlight of public attention on January 6th, but this is something that is not isolated on that day. And in fact, the forces that want greater authority and that are perhaps willing to use violence in pursuit of it are increasingly at home in the Republican Party. And that the Republican Party yesterday decided that it could not stand the public scrutiny, that, that it would quash the idea of a sustained, independent, bipartisan inquiry that examined fully all elements of the events leading up to the assault on the Capitol on January 6th. And, 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 and so today is a particularly good day then to start thinking about conservative parties in particular. And um, you will see that as, as, as we progress through these lectures, I'm gonna actually look uh, historically at the Republican Party. And the Republican Party, of course, is not a consistently or originally conservative party. This is the party of Lincoln and of Teddy Roosevelt and of Dwight Eisenhower, leaders who I think it would be difficult to characterize as conservatives, certainly not Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt, right? And, and, and so the Republican Party is not a consistently conservative party. And to really get a, a, a good perspective on parties that have been from the beginning to the end conservative and their extreme importance importance in the maintenance of democracy in the modern era. Uh, and and, and, and I'll, I'll just say to you something we, we've talked a little bit about before and we'll be talking about in greater length today. Conservative parties are typically the parties where those who might challenge democracy find themselves at home, at least if it's a two or even a multi-party system, they tend to gravitate to the conservative parties. There, there's a natural skepticism on the part of conservatives uh, with regards to democracy, especially at the outset of modern democracy, when more people who had been held powerless uh, for uh, centuries gained the franchise, gained political power, gained social standing as the result of democratization. Those forces that op op opposed uh, the 
extension of the franchise, originally universal male franchise in, in, in Europe, uh, lifting of property qualifications, lifting of race qualifications in this country, eventually lifting of gender qualifications, that, that those forces tended to organize in conservative parties, the forces opposing all of that or reluctant to accept all of that. And conservative parties, therefore, have been extremely important in determining the stability, the acceptability, the longevity of democracy in the modern world. Now, in, in saying all of this, I'm going to pivot from the Republican Party to contemporary scholarship. And, and I'm going to uh, focus on a man who we have talked together about in the past. His name is Daniel Zablat. He is uh, relatively young. He's, he's still in his 40s, uh, scholar at Harvard University. Um, he's uh, one of, uh, I think, the most impressive scholars of European comparative politics in the world today. And I'm going to focus primarily on this book, Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy. Uh, I'm going to point out to you that if the name Daniel Zablat is familiar, it is most likely because we've talked together before about How Democracies Die, which is a book that he co-authored with Stephen Levitsky uh, about three years ago. And at almost exactly the same time, uh, this book, Conservative Parties in the Birth of Democracy, which he'd been working on for a decade, came out. And uh, to, to give you a sense of, of the erudition of Sablat, um, in this book, he studies primarily British and German conservative parties. And he looks at not only the English language scholarship in both America and Britain, but also the German language scholarship. But he also brings in case studies on Sweden and Portugal and Spain and Italy. And in each of those cases, He's also doing research in the original languages, extensively familiarizing himself with both historical archives and contemporary scholarship. Um, and so to, to, to give you a sense for those of you who uh, are familiar with earlier political sociology and comparative politics, Barrington Moore Jr., who uh, wrote the famous text, The Social Bases of Dictatorship and Democracy, Zablat is being compared with Barrington Moore or, or regarded critically as the Barrington Moore of his age. And in particular, if um, the book that <coughs> he co-authored with Levitsky is about backsliding, that is to say, cases in which already established democracies begin to erode support for democracy. And if you remember briefly, the argument of how democracies die is that constitutional and legal mechanisms are insufficient to protect democracy, that we need informal norms, and that one of the major propagators of informal norms are political parties. Political parties screen out leaders who don't uh, adhere to the norms of, for instance, the loyal opposition. You lose an election, and rather than trying to contest the results of that election, if you're convinced that it's fair, rather than spreading lies or misinformation about that election, rather than trying to overthrow the government, you actually use the loss as an opportunity to consider what is it in, in your message that didn't work? What is it about the coalition that you've relied upon that is shifted and no longer a sufficient basis for electoral success? That you put fidelity to democracy alongside the desire to hold power and you play by the rules and the political parties 
choose leaders that are adherents of that core democratic commitment. They socialize their members into the idea that as much as we'd like to win every time we can't. And, and so the focus of how democracies die is in particular on political parties that stop adhering to the democratic dogma of loyal opposition and start prioritizing winning over playing by the rules of the game. The focus of the other book by Zablat is much more on democratic consolidation. When a young democracy comes into the world, how is it that over time it convinces those who are skeptical or reluctant or think that they're going to lose um, to nevertheless adhere to democracy? And again, Zablat emphasizes political parties. To set this up, I'm going to share a quote with you from Lord Salisbury from the late 19th century in Britain. And Salisbury defined democracy in this way a system of government in which the poor make all the laws and the rich pay all the taxes. Now, if you're Lord Salisbury, if you're one of the wealthiest men in Britain, that does not sound like a form of government that you should accept, right? And, and, and part of Zablat's argument is that there are a lot of Lord Salisbury's out there, a lot of people who view the transition to democracy as inherently hostile to their interests. How did those people become convinced to accept democracy? Zablat suggests it's a particular kind of conservative party and that in a sense, we can learn about why it is, when it is, how it is that conservative parties serve as pillars of support for democracy and perhaps also when and how it is that they withdraw support from democracy by looking at Zablat's account. So to set this up, and, and, and this is an, another week in which we're going to be more historical, more theoretical, I promise you the payoff will be there. We will return to 21st century American politics, and I believe we will be that much more equipped to understand what's happening in 2021 for having taken the theoretical and historical detours that I am leading you through in the weeks leading up to this. So, so that's my, my promissory note as I take you back to the middle of the 19th century and to the traditional answer to the question of the issue of, 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 of major social segments accepting the transition to democracy in Europe in the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. And I would point out to you that there are traditional answers to this question, answers that Daniel Zablat does not dispute, but nevertheless thinks are necessary but not sufficient conditions. One way to think about this is that there is just increased wealth. And, and so Lord Salisbury's perspective that the rich will pay all the taxes while the poor make all the laws is based in a less productive economy in which it's a zero sum competition. And as a result, if the poor or the middle is going to do better, the rich will necessarily suffer. But by the time we get to the middle of the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution, it is no longer a zero-sum competitive economy. And therefore, the rich who might think they're going to lose from democracy manage to reconcile themselves to democracy because the economy enables greater power for the less well-off without fundamentally violating the interests of the rich. And, and so that's one scenario in which right, all major social segments are able to accept the transition to democracy. Uh, a second scenario has to do with declining inequality. 
And this is slightly different from increased wealth. In particular, the emphasis here tends to be on a growing middle class. And the idea that as a society develops a large middle class, a group that is not rich, but also not devoid of poverty, there is a kind of buffer between the poor and the rich, a large group who shares some interest with the poor and some interest with the rich, therefore tends to swing back and forth in elections, depending upon whose interests seem best to align with their interests. And therefore, the rich actually, again, don't have as much to fear because they're not going to be overwhelmed in terms of the vote if they can find ways of making common cause with the middle class and assembling a large enough coalition. Third idea here is that by the time we get to the middle of the 19th century, early 20th century, we are in an era of global capitalism. Karl Marx already saw this in the Communist Manifesto in 1848. Uh, and, and, and it's worthwhile noting that the global economy was as integrated before World War I as it was 10 years ago, right? That is to say there was as much trade, as much mobility of capital and assets, and as much integration of production a uh, hundred plus years ago as there was 10 years ago, right? And, and, and so one of the things that an era in which capital and assets are mobile does is say to the rich, say to those who are currently elite, guess what? If you don't like the way things are going in your country, if you're worried about taxes and redistribution or land uh, reform, you can take your assets and put them in a Swiss bank and then the government and the unwashed masses will not be able to get their hands on it. So that's a, a third uh, account of how it is that the incumbent elites of the old regime managed to reconcile themselves to democracy. Fourth answer, and again, these, these are all compatible with each other, not mutually exclusive, and Zablat thinks they're all important in doing work, they're just not sufficient. The fourth answer is, look, in many societies, even though the masses got the vote, there were other institutions in place. And in Britain, the examples here include the House of Lords, which was non-electoral throughout much, most of the 20th century, right? Uh, and could veto things that came out of the House of Commons. And of course, the monarchy as well, which, which uh, had uh, effective veto power early uh, in the democratic transition period. And, and so although uh, the majority is being expanded, those who get the vote are increasingly people who do not share interests with the wealthy and the old elite, they are checked by the constitution of society. Now, here's what Daniel Zablat has to say about an argument like the argument I've been giving you from someone like uh, Barrington Moore Jr. And he says, well, the, the, there's a difficulty with this. And, and the difficulty is that there's not one pattern of um, democratization and democratic consolidation in Europe. There is broadly speaking two patterns, or to put it differently, a continuum uh, with uh, extreme cases on the ends and a uh, territory in the middle of more confused or uh, mixed cases. So the one case would be the settled democratic transition. And that's represented in this diagram by the United Kingdom from 1848 to, to 1950. And as you can see, um, there are increases in the degree to which uh, Zablat using a quantitative method considers 
Britain to be democratic. The, the, so uh, you, you've got the reform bill of the early or mid 1870s that increases uh, the uh, suffrage. You've got female suffrage later. You've got the, the decline of the monarchical veto uh, and eventually the decline of the House of Lords ability to check the House of Commons. Um, and, and all of these together are advances in democracy. And if you were to draw a straight line between the starting point and the end point, what you see is that the, the British case is one of fairly direct, even progress. There really aren't any setbacks and the developments occur at irregular inter intervals. And, and so this is uh, one pattern, the settern, settled pattern of democratization. And then at the other end of the extreme is Italy, or at least that's the paradigm case that Zablat is presenting here, in which there aren't any real democratic reforms throughout the second half of the 19th century, then there are democratic reforms, then there's a descent into fascism, and then there's rapid redemocratization in the middle of the 20th century. And so rather than taking the, the uh, shortest uh, course, the straight line between the starting point and the end point, Italy goes up and down and up, right? And, and, and so the problem here is that if we're focusing on increased economic growth and more to go around, or on a growing middle class, or on the mobility of capital, or on counter-majoritarian institutions, these don't separate the Italian case and the British case, right? The, the standard variables do not tell us why things went so smoothly in Britain and so roughly in Italy. And by the way, when we look at the spectrum, what we see is on Zablat's account, you've got the United Kingdom, Sweden, Belgium, Netherlands, and Norway as your kind of uh, standard cases of settled democratization. Denmark kind of in the middle, Italy, Germany, Portugal, France, and Spain <coughs> as unsettled cases, right? And, and, and much more volatile in terms of their democratization. So the standard explanations don't give us a good account of this kind of variability. Um, and in order to get at a better account, Zablat suggests we need to pay attention to the obstacles to democratization. When we look at that diagram from Italy, what is it that's causing things to go backwards as opposed to forwards? What is it that's causing a lapse in the democratization process? Obviously in Italy, we're talking about Mussolini and fascism. Uh, why is it that as opposed to consolidating democracy, Italy eventually replaced democracy with a fascist leader. And here, uh, Zablat asks us to focus on uh, the problem of incumbent old world elites, right? These are the people who are the nobility, the landed aristocracy, the very wealthy bourgeoisie, the members of politically connected families who are powerful in the pre-democratic regimes, powerful socially, powerful politically, and who typically have the capacity to resist democratic transitions if they want to. And, and when I say the power, they have the social power, they have the wealth, they have the connections, and oftentimes they have the political power. They've got the education, they've got the networks, they can organize, they can promote or sponsor proxy battles against democracy if they are so inclined. And, and so this is the group that Zablat asks us to focus on. We've talked about all major groups wanting to support democracy or finding their interests sufficiently 
uh, incorporated into democratic politics that they do not see themselves as under attack. And Zablat says this group often um, becomes either the most recalcitrant opponent of mass democracy and spends years, perhaps decades, trying to sow the seeds to undermine democracy or reluctant but essential Democrats. And, and, and part of what Zablat focuses on is when it is that the old world elites have what he calls sunken costs in democracy. When is it that they're sufficiently invested, either literally, economically or politically, that they've, they've, they've spent a lot of resources building up their party so that they believe that they need to continue to compete within the democratic system, or you might also say culturally and ethically. When is it that they actually begin to identify with democratic institutions and take pride in the fact that this is the way their society settles its political conflicts. And I, I, I want to um, take this forward into the contemporary moment and, and re-articulate Ziblatt's ideas as a basic condition on democracy, that there be no decisive losers. And, and when I say decisive losers, nobody who feels that their interests are completely disregarded, that they have no capacity to influence, no equal opportunity to shape the laws, the policies, especially those that most directly affect their interests. And, and that um, one of the ways to think about what's happening in the United States today is to ask whether this condition is being met and if it's not being met or if there's a perception that it's not being met, is there something that we can do about it in order to better meet this condition or convince those who are uh, currently perceiving that it's not met, that they are confused or mistaken. And, and so uh, a way of expressing the no decisive loser condition is to say that if political parties are indispensable in modern societies, if political parties are the mechanism via which those of us who are not already socially powerful or who see our social power under threat find mechanisms to influence how government operates. Uh, then the idea that we all are effectively represented within the party system, that each one of us thinks that there is some party that is sufficiently aligned with our needs, our interests, our views, our ideology, that we believe we have a representative, we have a dog in the fight, we have a spokesperson in the debate, uh, that is going to help to convince us that we're unlikely to be decisive losers. And then the, the final idea here, and, and Zablat is focusing on us, uh, uh, focusing our attention on the period on the one hand of industrialization, a, a rapid structural change in the economy, and on the other hand, on democratization, a similarly rapid structural change in the organization of the polity. And so in periods of rapid social or political transformation, fulfilling these two conditions, that there be no decisive losers, and that all are effectively represented within the party system, is often more difficult and also more urgent because these transitions may threaten people's interests at the same time that they may make it unclear who our representatives are, especially if the old parties or the old institutions no longer seem to be playing the role that they used to play. All right, so now, and I, I know there's a, a, a lot on the screen, let me try to, to work through this with you. Uh, what Zablat suggests is that old world elites 
were integrated into European democracy in those societies in which European democracy successfully consolidated, in which there was a settled transition to democracy, the old world elites were integrated via conservative parties that met certain conditions. And so the general point here, this is just a, a, another way of putting ideas that we've come across already, is that parties are the political carriers of organized interests in modern democracy. They are a key variable then that shapes the process of democratization and we need to pay attention to, in particular, the way in which they carry what Zablak calls ruling class interests. Those who are most powerful, how are they incorporated into political parties? And he puts it as uh, following terms, uh, well-organized and highly institutionalized partisan defenders of old regime interests provided a way of lowering the costs of toleration and making the democracy safe for key segments of old regime elites. So the, the key idea here is well-organized and highly institutionalized parties. What are such parties? How do they emerge? How do they reconcile incumbent elites to democracy? Uh, I believe that there are uh, about uh, seven variables that Zablat mentions. Um, the first, and, and, and this I think is extremely interesting and important in a historical sense, probably less relevant to us in 21st century America, is that the organization precedes democratization, the organization of the political party. Uh, and, and so part of the, the claim here is that it's important that a conservative party already have institution, institutional viability before the transition to democratization is complete or full, before universal male suffrage uh, is uh, institutionalized. And, and the issue here is that if the organization precedes full democratization, then the party itself can be established and strong, but if it doesn't, then it may be overwhelmed or incapable of adapting uh, to the new social circumstances by the time uh, the, the competition is going for electoral votes. Uh, a second factor here is the development of centralized, powerful conservative parties. And the emphasis here is in particular on their development within the parliament or the legislative body and that they be strong enough to discipline their members to in fact eject or marginalize people who are not willing to tow the party line and, and that this involves the development then of structures, of funding mechanisms, of institutions for reigning in or excluding dissident members. A third factor is the geographic spread of local associations. And, and uh, it actually starts with the Tory party in Britain, this model, and uh, it starts in various working class towns in Britain. The idea that the Tories start organizing local clubs, local chapters, and that the um, local chapters do two things. They first, be, they, they begin to recruit new people to the Conservative Party. They begin to recruit the newly emerging middle class, but they also serve as the antennae for the party, a way 
of gathering information, and it's extremely important on Sabat's account that the Conservative Party have some sense of what's happening at the local level, that they be able to assure themselves that the coming election is not going to be a conservative bloodbath, that, that we're actually in this, we've got a chance of winning it, and of learning what issues matter, matter to their potential allies in the middle class so that they can begin to forge that coalition that requires that they have a local, you might say, civil society presence, that they not just be parliamentary cliques, but also civil society institutions. And, and remember, this is before universal male suffrage sets in, and it's positioning the political conservative political parties to make that transition in a successful way. Fourth, and, and I think one of the critical variables here, is the professionalization of party operatives. The party becomes strong and successful enough that it's able to hire organizers and lawyers. It's able to begin to do the work of uh, hiring ideologues who, who write in the popular presses. And the, the party operatives, the bureaucrats, the professionals, um, are an important force for political pragmatism. They moderate the elected leaders by explaining to them, look, if you go over into moral panic, right, if, 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 if you start saying, if we democratize, the sky is falling, if you say out loud what Lord Salisbury said, if you suggest that the unwashed masses are necessarily uncivilized and a threat to everything British or everything valuable about your level of civilization and culture, you're going to lose the next election and the election after that. Whereas if you make more cautious, pragmatic critiques of the left parties, you will actually attract voters. And, and, and so this is, in a sense, the exact opposite of Max Faber and Robert Michels, in the sense that Zablat is emphasizing that the bureaucratization of conservative parties actually moderates their conservatism and strengthens democracy by getting conservative leaders to play the game by the rules. Uh, fifth factor, the identification of strategies to win popular support, support for politics that favor conservative interests. And, and I wanna be as clear as possible here, and this will be familiar to those of you who, for instance, have read uh, Thomas Frank's What's the Matter with Kansas? The idea that the conservative parties of the 19th century and early 20th century emphasized patriotism, emphasized empire, emphasized citizenship, military exploits, uh, issues that took some of the working class and some of the middle class away from a focus on inequality and redistribution and into a focus on maintaining institutions like the empire, like the military, like the House of Lords that might be adverse to their economic interests, but allowed them to organize their political identity in a different way. And, and, and again, Zablat, I think, is very insightful in suggesting that this is not something the Republican Party invented with uh, issues to do with abortion, et cetera. This has been going on for 150, 170 years. The effort to use a different frame for thinking about political identity and political interests in order to get those who might be potentially 
strongly opposed to conservative interests, in fact, to support conservative parties for reasons other than their taxation policy or their approach to redistribution of land holdings or resources. Um, and the, the final claim here is that political knowledge reduces uncertainty and fear, right? That, that if you've got a strong party with a professionalized core who have built local institutions and identified good strategies, then you can say to your leaders or to those who are your potential supporters but frightened of the possible outcome of the next election or the democratic transition or the reform package, look, we have a strategy. We need to adhere to that strategy. If we do, we've got a good chance of actually coming out ahead or at least being able to preserve our core interests despite the growing power of the working and the middle class. And so in all of these ways, right, conservative parties served to integrate old world elites into the new world institution of parties, right? And these are elites who had relied on what Zablat refers to as the moral economy of notability, just being powerful, and especially on patronage, on the idea that if you want a job, if you need a little bit of support when there's a drought or a crop failure, I will help you, but then you've also got to have my back when I need you, right? That's, that, that's the old moral economy, economy of notability. That's how they'd secured their political influence. Th this creation of these new political parties allowed this old world elite to see that they could still have their influence, that it could be translated across the threshold of the democratic transition so that they would remain perhaps not equally influential, but sufficiently influential that the transition to democracy and industrialism would not be a disaster to them. Now, I'll just ask you to, to, to think about this for a moment. We have had similar transitions in the United States in the last 50 years. As opposed to transitioning to an industrial economy, we have transitioned to a post-industrial economy. As opposed to working class enfranchisement, we have seen the Jim Crow system in the South overturned by legal cases and civil rights law and increased immigration that has substantially altered the composition of the electorate. Have we allowed those who had some influence over politics in the old regime, and, and here obviously I'm referring to an already seemingly democratic regime, to see how their influence could be preserved as we become a more diverse post-industrial economy. I'll get into that more, but I, I just want to make clear that there are important lessons to be drawn from Zablat's account of 18th, 19th, 20th century democratic transitions for our 21st century transition. Finally, Zablat spends quite a while on the alternative. And when I say alternative, those societies, and, and if we go back here for a moment, we're talking about Spain, uh, especially in a kind of an exemplary case, but also France uh, or Portugal or Germany or Italy, those societies in which strong, well-organized, professionalized, influential conservative parties did not emerge. How did conservatives pursue those interests in those societies. And his suggestion is that they turn to what he calls 
anti-competitive strategies. Trying to win the next election is a competitive strategy. An anti-competitive strategy is based on the idea or fear that there's no way you're gonna win fair and square in the next election, so you need to find some way around the next election. And they identified strategies of fraud. In, in, in uh, Spain, for instance, they simply bought off all the local election officials and determined in advance of any vote being counted what the electoral results were going to be. Uh, manipulation. Uh, clientelism, again, right, something that was very popular in this country in the 19th century, buying people's votes or buying them off by giving them preferential appointments within the government, straight out fraud, right, and I'm sorry I've listed that twice, maybe it's worth emphasizing, and collusion, right, essentially saying to the left or the working class party, We'll let you win this time if you let us win next time. Let's take turns. And, and, and Portugal and France had systems like this where no matter what happened with the election, every other election, the conservative parties got their turn in power, right? And, and on the other hand, because the conservative parties were not trying to build at the local level, were not identifying adequate electoral strategies, did not have professionals encouraging pragmatism and allowing them to see a way in which their interests could be adequately incorporated into a democratic system. Uh, and instead, conservatives often felt a sense of moral panic. If the world continues on the path that it's on, we will be left behind, our assets will be confiscated, we will lose our political influence. Heck, we may be headed to the guillotine, right? And, and, and if in, in these kinds of um, desperate moral panic moments, the right-wing old elite made common cause with right-wing insurgents, with fascists, with anti-democratic forces, and the elites in particular who often relied on these local insurgent movements or on forces within the military who wanted to grab power often also found themselves incapable of controlling the forces that they had unleashed, that their parties just weren't well organized, weren't strong enough. Whereas with the well organized conservative party on the one hand, you never needed to encourage right wing, often student movements modeled on the brown shirts on Mussolini or Hitler's uh, storm troops, right? And on the other hand, if at some point you were perhaps tempted to enlist uh, more radical elements, you also had the strength within your party to prevent them from taking over your party. And, and so again, the contrast then between the Italian case and the British case, or between the countries that had settled and the countries that had unsettled paths to democratization depends on the presence of that strong conservative party. Um, and this is then a, a, a summary of uh, Zablat's account of the difference between a strong hierarchical mass party, especially a conservative party, and a weak, what he calls contracting out party. That its leadership is parliamentary, but also salaried professionals, whereas the weak party only has the parliamentary leaders. It has local associations stably present, whereas the weak conservative parties only sporadically have local associations. They spread their presence throughout the society or just in regions where they're already strong, occasionally spreading beyond that. And 
if they uh, rely on outside interest groups or radical reactionary groups, they are subordinated and contained in a strong hierarchical mass party. Whereas in a weak party, the outside interest groups end up competitive with parliamentary leaders and sometimes dominant. And again, when we think about the role of outside interest groups, I do think that when we tell the story of America in the 21st century, uh, one of the big important, I guess I'll say the first quarter of the 21st century at least, one of the really important chapters is going to be focused on the Tea Party and the way in which, uh, and, and I've, I've suggested in a previous lecture that this is not a grassroots movement, right? This is a so-called AstroTurf movement. This was funded, sponsored, organized, by rich elites who no longer saw the Republican Party as sufficiently in their corner. And then lo and behold, you can draw a pretty straight line from the Tea Party to Donald Trump, from Donald Trump to January 6th, an erosion of support for democracy. All right, I will stop there and uh, I'm gonna unmute everyone. <laughs> Uh, and please try to keep the, the background noise down if you got any. And who wants to start us out with a, a I do. Go ahead, Flossie. What about the church? You have left out religion. You have left out the evangelicals. You have left out the Roman Catholic Church in Spain and in Italy. I, I see some modicum of hope is that the present group of lunatics does not seem to have a big church behind them. I may be wrong. Yeah, and, and yeah. fantastic point, Flossie, and thank you for raising that. And of course, religion is another important element in this story. Zablat doesn't emphasize it in his overall theoretical framework. But as I tried to, to say, a substantial portion of the book is detailed case studies of Britain and Germany. And in particular, in the German case, not only the conservatism of German Catholics, but also the divide between German Catholics and Protestants, and then of course, the anti-Semitism, right? The mistrust of a large religious minority seen as the uh, carriers in many respects, the, the cutting guard or cutting edge or avant-garde of modernization all fed into the weak uh, institutionalization of conservative parties as opposed to there being a single umbrella conservative party, you had, <clears throat> sorry, separate Catholic and Christian Protestant conservative parties in the German case. So, so yes, absolutely right. Now, <clears throat> does that give us optimism for the current American case? I'm not sure, to be honest with you, right? And, and, and the uh, way in which the contemporary conservative uh, radical right-wing racial element of the Republican Party tends to get a fair bit of support from evangelicals does give me cause for concern, especially when you have somebody as unsavory, you would think, religiously speaking, as Donald Trump from a moral <laughs> religious perspective, right? Yeah, and you and nevertheless yeah. have a kind of transactional approach in which you are willing to overlook the infidelity, et cetera, because he promises the right kind of judges, right? That, 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 that is concerning to me in the American case as well. Thank you, Flossie. Good point. John, go ahead. It seems to me, I, I think that's a brilliant book. I haven't read it, but the analysis seems absolutely on, on target for me in looking at Europe. If you were applying that to the United States, um, 
I think the biggest difference is the availability to these uh, right wing, these conservative elites, the availability of the race issue in the United States, together with the kind of peculiar structure of the electoral college that makes our elections, you know, so vulnerable to that sort of thing. That uh, that, that that's it fits in with the argument perfectly well, but it's 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 more true in the United States than in most European countries. The Jews in Germany are a little similar, but that's kind of a different. Uh, yeah. And, and I'm going to um, next lecture talk about the Republican Party and I'm going to draw on Heather Cox Richardson, who some of you may already be familiar with, but a, a very interesting contemporary historian. Uh, and, and she uh, has a history of the Republican Party called To Make Men Free, which looks at the oscillation of the Republican Party uh, being uh, successively a very progressive party and then a very conservative party several times throughout its existence. And I'm just going to add to what John just said another factor, which is the availability of land in the West in the United States. Right, and, and, and the idea that there is an, a, a, an engine, a, a, an outlet, an uh, escape valve for pent up aspirations for at least many working class or poor white Americans, right? That, that they can um, not have to, and, and this is similar to Barrington Moore Jr.'s idea that when there's rapid economic growth, there's a possibility for non-competitive politics, or at least for, for non-zero-sum politics. The idea that in the United States, our poor can turn west and find an outlet there. By the way, Cox Richardson thinks that the emergence of the cowboy myth is actually very destructive. That, that originally uh, Lincoln, and others are organizing the Republican Party to present, prevent the spread of slave power West so that it can be a genuine engine of opportunity. When you get the cowboy myth, you begin to get a different understanding of the political significance of the West, especially as it's used by re Republicans, all the way up to Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan. <laughs> All right, anybody else? We, we had the usual suspects, Flossie and John, and anybody else want to come in? All right, everybody. Uh, uh, take care, uh, enjoy the holiday weekend, be well, and uh, more to come, this time getting more specifically American, still historical, but looking at the history of the Republican Party next week. See you soon. Good to be with you as always. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Get some water.